with the helicopter drop of the nuclear option, the argument is no central bank can remain satisfied when inflation is below the lower bound because there's always that nuclear option. So you must continue more and more aggressive policies until inflation comes back on track. This is the mantra in, in a number of industrial countries. Now, it's not clear that if you drop money from a helicopter, people who get that money will go out and spend it. They might think the government's gone crazy. Let's put the money in our pockets because things are going to get from bad to worse now. Or what does the government know that we don't know that they're throwing money out of the helicopters? This must be really, uh, you know, Kaliyug, and let's, uh, let's, uh, let's adjust. The point is monetary policy works through people's expectations. Again and again, we found in these times that what seems like it should work, the zero interest rate policy, the expansion in reserves to quantitative easing, doesn't seem to because people adjust. This was the old Chicago school, Milton Friedman and others, discredited because New Keynesian took off. But maybe there's something to this, that people do adjust, people do worry in times of recession, do build up uh, their, their uh, uh, do try and offset government uh, excesses, and therefore you can't get things back on track. Now, why I'm saying this is, the industrial country central banks don't seem to recognize any limit to these policies, at least not explicitly and openly. And as a result, as an emerging market, we have to prepare for them to continue uh, uh, for a longer period of time. What is more, once they've got into these policies, it's very hard to get out. Because having depreciated your exchange rate, everybody else having depreciated their exchange rate, Anytime you start talking about getting out, your exchange rate starts booming. And the very growth, which was the reason for you to get out, now starts falling because now your exchange rate has gone up. And as I said, for industrial countries, that may be more of an effect to bear. So we're sort of caught in a chakra view, right? You can get in, but you can't get out. Hotel California. <laughs> so um, how do we get out? I think that's really uh, the the question. Uh, I do hope that in a measured way uh, the Federal Reserve uh, does uh, move based on the, on the uh, strength of the economy. I also do hope that we don't get any untoward strengthening of the economy which will move uh, Federal Reserve policy much faster. This is something to be uh, to wait and see. Certainly at every forum they've talked about a transparent and steady process. I think that's, that's right. But I think we also need to consider other central banks, whether in fact more aggression now is the need of the hour, or whether we should let other tools of policy take, take, uh, take charge, rather than central bankers being the only game in town, and in fact fueling problems down the line. Now, given this, I have talked about the possibility, uh, medium term, nothing ever happens in the international arena in the short term, but medium term, of devising some rules of the game. The IMF, the only thing it prohibits is one-sided, unilateral, sustained intervention in the exchange rate, okay? So the only countries that get hit by this are the emerging markets. Uh, do we need more expansive rules of the game, which essentially look at all kinds of monetary policies and measure the net spillover effects of these policies and make some judgment about whether these are on net beneficial for the world or not. And uh, elements that will go into this judgment are, are they temporary, are they long-term policies, are they negative short-term but positive over the cycle. You can imagine a country which is trying to jumpstart its economy and depreciates its exchange rate for a short while in order to keep, provide that boost it gets the economy going and then long run it provides net positive demand for the rest of the world and it's a good thing. So uh, short term versus long term, uh, <coughs> temporary versus permanent and effects are clear versus effects are fuzzy. Uh, so what, what uh, I think we should do is start debating all these aggressive policies and look at the consequences. And, and I think what is important is to understand that just because it's called monetary policy 
doesn't mean that it gets a free pass from the international community. Just because we have a domestic mandate as a country doesn't mean that anything goes as we move towards our domestic mandate. If there are negative spillover effects for the rest of the world, that should be also something that governs what we do. And, 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 and I think that's something that we need to discuss, we need to do more. Uh, it's something that certainly uh, we've been, uh, I've been trying to push. Um, now, if we had <coughs> such a discussion, what form would it take? I think first we, we do studies. Uh, all international uh, agreements start on the basis of studies. We find out what the effects are, uh, who's hurt, who's benefited, and then start an international discussion. Are these policies good ones? Or on net problematic? Uh, and then eventually have a conference which could establish new rules of the game, maybe a new Bretton Woods if, if we have come that far. Um, and eventually, after much discussion, uh, much analysis, perhaps uh, central banks could revise their mandates and have an international component in their mandate. I won't do things only because it benefits my country. I also take into account the effects of my policy on other countries. Now, when I say this in international fora, I immediately get a pushback. You're saying this because you're from India, you affect nobody, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's much, uh, much more difficult when, uh, when, uh, when you're the Fed or you're the ECB or, or, uh, or Japan. And, and, and my point repeatedly has been, I would say the same thing, uh, and I presume we would be large enough to affect somebody uh, in, the next, uh, in the next 10 years, but I think it would be important for us to set the stage for that kind of international dialogue, which I, I don't see these kinds of dialogues producing anything uh, in, uh, without, you know, uh, with, within the span of years, I think it's more decades. But if we can have that dialogue started, by the time it comes to fruition, we will be affected by it. But I think it's important that we start that dialogue. So what do we do? You know, two trillion dollar economy, small relative to the rest of the world, five speed growing uh, um, and trying to uh, reach its potential. I would say what we've done in the face of this macro vulnerability is, is a number of things. Well, first we focused on macro stabilization building buffers and reducing our own domestic vulnerabilities. And I point to three important things. The fiscal consolidation, the government has continued uh, and, and, and uh, stayed on that fiscal path despite the temptation to get off. Uh, inflation control, which has helped establish some support for our currency. Our currency is one of the most stable currencies. And I have to point this out to Mark Carney, more stable than the pound currently. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, Brexit has a, has a, has a, has a you know, implication there. And, and third, bank cleanup. We need to clean up the banks, and, uh, and we are in the process of cleaning up the banks. But I think if we continue on this path, uh, we have established relative macro stability, and in a, a difficult world, uh, we, we look different. Uh, second, wherever possible, we undertake macro reforms. And if macro reforms are not possible, move the needle on micro reforms. Do things that nobody's looking at that don't attract opposition. Of course, on the macro reforms, the biggest thing on the plate is GST. And um, uh, I think there's a lot of hope that it will happen. But in the meantime, there's a lot that is happening. Uh, for example, crop insurance, uh, widespread crop insurance uh, which is reliable, which comes quickly, is paid quickly, and is based on adequate measurement of losses, uh, which is what the government uh, uh, is, uh, is trying to implement, will help tremendously in providing a flow of, for our farmers, but also provide adequate diversification of crops, movement towards crops that we need, rather than crops that are relatively safe. And, and that, I think, would be a very important. Another form of micro reform, the Rajasthan government recently talked about land titling. I think this is an extremely important reform because land is the single biggest capital asset in emerging markets. If you can have appropriate land titling, the ability to borrow against that land increases tremendously. The rapidity of use of that land increases. We need that land titling, not just in Rajasthan, not just in Karnataka, but across the country we need to do that. 
Now, of course, we're proceeding uh, in a steady pace in financial sector reforms. I, I mentioned these. I don't want to go into a long dialogue on the reforms that are taking place. There are many that I haven't mentioned. But the point is that there is a lot of good happening, even if you don't look at the headline reforms, <coughs> such as GST. The bankruptcy code passed in, uh, in parliament, um, in, in the lower house. Uh, there have been a bunch of other things that are happening. The, the bottom line, is that good policy is the first line of defense against an uncertain global economy. And uh, after two droughts and a very weak global economy, the fact that we are doing reasonably well, I think, is testament to the fact that a substantial amount of good policy has gone in. Second, to limit external vulnerabilities, we have controlled inflows. That doesn't mean we have stopped inflows, but we control them. In, in some places, not, not in all, our equity markets are open. The problem comes with debt markets, especially short-term debt markets, where uh, you know the um, speculative element wants to sit in overnight money and uh, move at the first sign of trouble. We got into trouble with short-term debt in, in, in the summer of 2013. Since then, we've done two things. Uh, uh, we've reframed the ECB policy so as to make sure that People who don't have easy access to external uh, foreign exchange earnings don't borrow in foreign exchange. They don't incur the asset liability mismatch. But we've also uh, limited the capacity of foreign investors to hold short-term government or corporate debt. So I think that has given us some uh, stability in the debt markets. Uh, we've also encouraged people to borrow more in rupees. So. Uh, the Masala bond, we're certainly uh, talking to uh, players in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, not we, but Indian players are talking. Our hope is we can issue rupee bonds, we can have our people issue rupee bonds soon. And the ability to borrow in rupees across the world will both help the internationalization of the rupee, but also limit the risk <coughs> when this borrowing takes place. It's not riskless. People who still want their money will sell those rupee bonds and leave. But at least it's in rupees, and uh, the company borrowing in rupees doesn't have a exchange rate mismatch. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, also allow outflows when a lot of money is coming in. Remember, risk on is also a problem, as is risk off. So when money comes in hand over fist, we want to let it out. Now, one way to let it out is to, for us to buy reserves. But uh, there's a limit to how much we want to do of that. Instead, another way to let it out is to let our private parties take the money out. So the LR scheme by which they can take money out by investing in, in securities or spending for their kids, education, and so on, we've expanded that now to $250,000 per person. And I think that's substantial for anybody who wants that money. I have said repeatedly, this is a also has a macro prudential element. If things get tough, this could be reduced. If things get easier over time, I suspect this could be expanded. But the point is, it allows us a safety valve. When money comes in really rapidly, it allows us to send it out without uh, uh, necessarily taking it onto government coffers, which is problematic. And finally, we do intervene in the exchange rate. Now, not in a unidirectional uh, fashion, but really to create sand in the wheels in the process. If a lot of money is flowing in, in a big way, which we think is unsustainable, likely to flow out, um, we do buy up the currency that's coming in. And if a lot of money is flowing out in a way which we think is because of global risk of factors and not uh, defined by Indian parameters, uh, we actually sell foreign exchange. And as a result, we typically intervene on both sides of the market. But uh, basically, uh, we are uh, very aware of the possibility that foreign exchange and investor sentiment can have both negative feedback loops as well as positive feedback loops. When it's coming in, our exchange, uh, our stock exchanges are increasing in value, uh, holdings are increasing in value, leverage is going down, everything seems hunky-dory, so more money comes in. When it goes out, everything reverses. So these things have lives of their own. What we need to do is 
try and short circuit the positive feedback loop as well as the negative feedback loop, which sometimes are seen as not pure leading the economy. The point is, if you're a peer leader, you get your highs as well as you get very low lows. What we would like is a little more stability because that in the long run is much better for growth than, than ups and downs. So bo bottom line is we're trying not to get seduced by easy foreign capital in an environment where central banks across the world have kept capital very easy and very uh, accessible. But if we succumb to that temptation today, we may pay for it tomorrow. So we want to be much more steady about that process. The aim then, finally, of our reserve holdings is really to allow us the flexibility to deal with that, that volatility. And so it's not to maintain a target for the exchange rate. We haven't maintained the target. You can see there is movement in the currency, but our currency is somewhat more stable, cut wood, than other currencies today. I'm not guaranteeing that it will be the case. I'm not, that, uh, but, but it is something that has happened, not just because of the inflation, but because of the good policies that have been followed as well as the investment in stability. So let me end by saying there is uh, obviously from what I've said, great uncertainty about the outlook uh, as well as the continuation of policies uh, that may be, uh, that may have negative spillovers for us over time. What we're trying to do in the country is to take sensible measures. Um, and sensible measures means economics still works. Uh, their demand curve slowed down. Uh, so we do uh, take that into account. Um, we're trying to create a stable platform for strong and sustainable growth. So achieve good macro stability and then as the tailwinds come, hopefully a good monsoon, uh, hopefully stronger growth in the global economy, as the tailwinds come, we can move to a higher plane without the fragilities that would otherwise plague us. And for that, we don't really to need to know the exact answer to why the world is growing so slowly. Uh, we certainly have plenty of domestic demand we can tap. We can essentially uh, uh, make in India, uh, we can make India, and if the world cooperates for India, uh, for, for the world, but if the world doesn't cooperate, we can make in India for India, and that will be something that will help us over time until the world gets better. Let me stop there. Thank you. Well, friends, you would agree that has been a very stimulating lecture. And Dr. Aguram Rajan has agreed to answer a few questions. So if you could raise your hand the mic will be brought to you. Please introduce yourself and please keep your questions brief. Yes, all over the world. And not only per se standalone tax havens, but also tax haven structures within many developed countries. In fact, it's become easy for people in many parts of the world to legally transport money as for the laws of those countries. Something which those countries don't permit for their own citizens, they let other citizens come and do that. And what role you think G20 together can do about it. Thank you. Gajendra uh, Halvia. watching the RBI over, over the past decade in respect of banking regulation. Well, while I can say that uh, the ba RBI has protected the Indian economy so far as macro policy is concerned, I think 
In my view, it has failed the Indian economy so far as banking regulation is concerned. I think we are in fairly deep trouble. And uh, my own estimate is that the taxpayer will have to pay close to or over 6 lakh crores to save the bank. That's 100 billion US dollars. We all know that the market cap capitalization of uh, public sector banks has completely dried up, a small proportion of what, what it used to be. Uh, I think much of this has happened because of malfeasance, malfeasance because of lack of accountability. And a good example to draw from is the US, where subprime housing actually damaged the economy, not only of the US, but of the whole world because of malfeasance. And a similar thing has happened in India in infrastructure. And this 6 lakh crores is mostly from there. Uh, I have actually written a paper on subprime infrastructure in August uh, last year, a copy of which I sent to you, and it's, it's on my personal website. And it demonstrates what deep trouble we are in. <coughs> and from August uh, to now, we have declined. And I'm afraid we'll continue to decline quite sharply in the next two years because the problems have not been clearly identified, they have not been addressed uh, because we don't recognize them. The great difference between US uh, experience and Indian experience is that while the problems were recognized, penal action was taken, corrective action was taken. In our system, I don't think the banks and the RBI are very clear in recognizing the problem, leave, leave apart, uh, you know, taking care of it. Okay, I can, for, I'll yeah. just conclude, ma'am. Uh, just to give you an example, I'll be happy to share with you a list of 100 projects where the banks gave yeah, I think 100. You know, uh, Rajiv, I, uh, I see six okay. hands. Uh, you I, can I share this information later. So my last point, later. My, my, I, would be, uh, I would request you to tell us what the uh, uh, you know, roadmap is about yeah. banking revolution. Thank, Thank you. you. I see a hand there, please. Dr. Rajan, you concluded your your lecture by you have to introduce yeah, yourself. Dr. Saranjit today, uh -huh. the way you said of India impact on global uh, global impact on India, my concern is about uh, British debating membership of UK, EU. The way recently uh, President Obama was trying to convince the people not to quit this uh, EU. So do you think it will have some impact on global economy or Indian economy? Thank you. Yes, a question. I am Manish Sharma. My question is that you have missed one point regarding the trade agreements. You know, trade agreements are also uh, putting a lot of pressure on the global trade because of you know these uh, TPP uh, thing coming up uh, with America. You know, mega regional agreements and China will also take up a step. You know, by dumping. You know, so dumping will also uh, dumping is also playing a major role. You know, as far as uh, putting pressure on these uh, on this trade. You know, global trade as a whole. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I am Mahesh Khera from AVG Technologies and my question is related to understanding the economic impact of technology on our national programs like Make in India, Digital India and Smart Cities and the others, knowing that uh, increased uh, penetration of technology enhances the GDP, have we as a nation integrated the impact economic impact of technology <coughs> into these national programs? Yeah. That's the Thank question. You. May I? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so uh, let me, uh, some of these are, are <coughs> probably more directly in my, uh, in my bailiwick, some are more peripheral. Tax havens, for example, uh, they do uh, gain some importance when we're going after, uh, you know, the occasional promoter who's taken money out and uh, buried it in some tax haven, or, or uh, buried it in such a way in uh, in fairly big countries, such that the beneficial owner is hard to hard to determine. So it is an issue that the government uh, has been taking up with a number of uh, countries. That uh, certainly we would uh, benefit from knowing who the beneficial owner of those luxury flats. Uh, in those capital cities around the world are, and many of them uh, may, in fact, uh, um, uh, once we know the beneficial owner, may help us recover some of the uh, the money that has gone out. Again, 
the the quantum of such uh, such assets is is uh, is not clear, uh, uh, and uh, I don't want to say that it's huge without without any additional information. But I think when across the world we are trying to reduce the impact of tax havens and tax avoidance, I think it's incumbent uh, on countries across the world to ensure that final ownership of assets is clear, and uh, <coughs> if it's foreign final ownership that the foreign government or foreign entity can get hands on these assets if they were uh, moved illegally. Um, second, uh, on uh, uh, Mr. Haldia's point about the size of the uh, uh, bad debts, uh, uh, I think you're talking about six lakh crores in losses as opposed to six lakh crores in stressed assets, in losses. Uh, I mean, that number is, is probably higher, uh, uh, significantly higher than we would put it. Um, of course, I've read your paper, so uh, I know what your perspective is. Uh, but let me put it this way. Uh, uh, there was uh, undoubtedly some malfeasance in the lending. Uh, but there were also other factors that were involved. Remember 2007, 2008, we're coming from a period when assets have been created that have worked wonderfully well, no constraints. Power plants are built in two, three years, uh, and it looks wonderful. They've been built with moderate leverage, uh, and so now that they've built, been built so easily, uh, the promoter says, why don't I go in for more leverage and do two plants rather than one plant, and let me put less equity, in fact, let me borrow my equity. So over-optimism, which is, which is clearly a factor in country after country in good times, also plays a part. Also remember, we get hit by the global financial crisis and then we get hit by a really serious slowdown, both in government activity, permissions, etc., but also in uh, normal activity. Uh, people aren't traveling on the roads as much as they used to or the growth rate has slowed down. So the precise uh, sort of distinction between what was malfeasance, what was uh, over-optimism, and what was just bad luck is, I think, very hard to establish. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of each. My point today is, at this point, uh, what is important for us is not so much to establish this. There is a, a legal issue, there is a criminal issue, there's an issue of justice, which I think the <coughs> investigative agencies should take their own course uh, figuring that out. But from the perspective of the economy, which is what my uh, 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 bailiwick is, we need to put these assets back on track. I don't care if there's malfeasance in creating the asset. Yes, somebody should go after the promoter, uh, and, and I'm happy to extend all help to the investigative agencies doing that. But I also want the workers in that plant today who are in danger of being put out of a job to have that job, to be able to produce, because a non-functional asset is in nobody's interest. Uh, uh, certainly not the nation's. So what we've been trying to do is do that. Now you talked about the US versus India. Remember the US has a well-functioning bankruptcy code. It has a well-functioning system in which a lot of activity is done, uh, a lot of resolution is done either inside the bankruptcy system or with the shadow of the bankruptcy system saying that if you don't cooperate, I'll take you to, to the bankruptcy system. We don't have that. Till recently, the threats that banks could make to promoters were meaningless, which is why the promoter could go to the banker and say, you know, take uh, 25 paise on the rupee, otherwise I'll see you in court for the next 15 years. So given that, the fact that we've moved forward at all, I think is a credit to the system. Now with the bankruptcy code, it takes some time to put in place, I think we can move faster, but at the Reserve Bank, we've been creating a, a, a structure which will at least help the out-of-court resolution. Uh, and we're still at work. It's work in progress. We are, we are, we are fine-tuning it, making sure it works. There are lots of incentives, one way or the other, that we have to deal with. Uh, but I think we are making progress. We're making significant progress. And assets are slowly coming back on track. Assets are being sold to pay down the debt. So. I think we, 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 we will, uh, we will um, sort of limit the size of the problem. Now you said we, we recognize too late. Well, in every crisis, 
there's always the issue, should I precipitate further problems by recognizing the problem and dealing with it now, or should I wait a, you know, a week more, a month more, maybe things resolve itself. Again and again, you see the plea from the bankers, the plea from the promoters, sometimes even the plea from the government is, wait, don't precipitate anything, let's this thing uh, go on for a little more time and resolve. Now, at some point, you have to bite the bullet and say it's not getting better. The industry is not getting better. The world is not getting better. The economy is going to take time to recover. This problem will explode if we don't deal with it now. And that's why the RBI has been very focused on dealing with the problem. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think we have it contained. I'm, I'm confident we have it contained. Uh, and, and we're working on it. Trade agreements, dumping, I, Isher, I think, is, is better suited to answer those, uh, uh, those questions. All I will say is that one has to be very careful of going back in a significant way on our openness. Uh, every tariff that helps a particular producer is a cost to another producer who buys the output that this producer makes. So in rendering one segment competitive, we may render other segments uncompetitive. And if all this happens based on lobbying and so on, we run the risk of introducing uh, you know, uh, practices that we did away in the past. So we have to be very careful. The government is moving on a measured pace, but uh, let's be careful about calling everything dumping and putting up tariffs once again. Uh, on the economic impact of technology on Make in India and Digital India and so on, uh, absolutely, we need technology. Uh, and uh, I mean, I, I think this will be the way we leapfrog in a number of uh, situations uh, because for the number of people we have, uh, for, the, for the level of wealth, uh, we do a lot of small transactions. And the only way to make those small transactions economic is to make maximum use of, of digital technology. Certainly in the financial sector, we see that we have some of the largest number of transactions uh, payment systems in the world. Uh, and I have to confidently say we have a state-of-the-art payment system. Uh, in fact, the other day with the UPI, which was inaugurated, is the first uh, public payment system where you can make uh, payments from one phone to another. Uh, it's uh, reaching the final stages of testing uh, uh, in the next uh, 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 month or so, I'm hopeful that we should see it being unveiled for people to be able to. So technology, absolutely important. How do we get it? That's a different issue. And we have to worry about you know, whether we bring it in uh, by buying it, whether we buy people who have, who know the technology, we create research centers and so on. That's an ongoing work. Thank you. I see a hand there. Yes, please. World Affairs. Uh, you have given a very complex mm -hmm. sub subject in a very lucid manner. We understood all what you, you are saying. I have three small queries. Number one, that you said that our monetary policy, that is demand and supply of money, should be balanced by allowing outflow of money. What do you think that if Panama and other black money comes into India, what cascading effect or what positive effect it will create? Whether it is possible to bring all those things? Number one, it, whether it's possible to? to bring all those money uh, back to the country, number one. Number second, that uh, you said that uh, if the world is not responding to our Make in India program, we should make in India pro program for Indians. Whether this Make of India program is not uh, becoming successful because of the global slowdown of the economy, or people are uh, reserving themselves to invest in India. Why is this happening? Second, that whether people are have adopted wait and watch policy because of the promises we made to re undertake, that is land reform, tax reform, labor laws, and many others. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question here. I'm Dr. P. S. I was wondering whether we have uh, find out as to how much exchange rate will be during next five years or ten years. 
Similarly, but will be the inflation during next five years or ten years. Because uh, we calculate, we project, and uh, we don't know whether we are able to achieve that or not because of inflation and uh, foreign exchange association. And another point is that the time has come, I think, to remove this secrecy class in the banking system, if possible, so that many people who are general, they are safe, and people who are not general, they should be, action should be taken against them. Thank you. Thank you. There's a question there. Slightly less demanding question. Uh, my name is Anmol Sohin. I'm from PwC. You talked about, you used the balloon analogy to talk about how pressing uh, regulations on banks and the financial players lead to the creation of a parallel shadow banking economy. Could a potential silver lining for India be innovative disruptors coming out because of that shadow economy? Like with China, where strict regulations led to the birth of Tencent and financial, your power sector. Are we looking at <coughs> the private sector pushing towards innovation and disruption because of the growth of the shadow parallel economy. Thank you. Yes, question there. My name is Ajay, I'm a farmer. And controlling inflation has been one of the main objects of this government and the last government. And food inflation is an is a important component of controlling inflation. But in the last one decade, it's been seen that controlling food inflation by keeping food prices artificially low by is being de is detrimental to farmer interests. Do you approve the way food inflation is being controlled? And if you don't approve of it, what do you suggest? <laughs> thank you. Rajan, thank you so much for, yeah, for yeah. I have the mic too. Talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Governor Rajan, uh, for a very interesting talk. My name is Targi, my name is Targi Mohan, and I have a very any question about the tiny detail of your talk. I am just wondering why people still continue to call fixed income securities. I mean, I am wondering why people seem to refer, seem to think of fixed income securities as safe and reliable even after the global financial crisis. Uh, after all, we have mortgage backed securities and asset bank securities. Yeah, this is in relation to your question, in your, your statement about the 50 year olds who are relying on the fixed in the security. Thank you. I think there's a question here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one, I wanted to compliment that it was after a long time I heard economists speaking finance and talking practical things. Maybe your science background helped it, so thank you. The, and I'm a physicist and I'm trying to understand the economy. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Saxena. I used to work in telecom and we did bring about some change in India as far as telecom was concerned. Now the question is, one which is a very uh, dumb question, trivial question, saying that in your perception, over what period of time India will become a two-eyed king rather than a one-eyed king? <laughs> two-eyed king rather than a one-eyed king? <laughs> one. The other question is, uh, which is very direct, saying that you said in the end the recipe that we should make India for Indians. The question is how much scope it has with the competition from China, where the cost and the regime is very different, so that India ab initio may not be able to compete. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, the young lady there. Um, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for the lecture. So my question relates Your name. to. Sorry, I'm Devyani. Uh, my question relates to the taxi hailing services in India, which have come up in a huge way. So we all know that Uber and Ola ran into trouble last year with uh, the RBI compliance uh, norms. What kind of uh, problems do you foresee in this sector in the future, and what is going to be RBI's uh, policy measures in the future? Thank you. Okay. Another young lady here. Yeah. After this. Good evening, sir. May I first compliment you on your wonderful lecture, sir? Uh, I'm Dr. Anupama from Amity University. Sir, I would just like to ask you, how significant would be these new initiatives such as the Jam Trinity, the DBT, the NPS, the sector, have an effect on the long-term economy, Indian economy? Thank you. Thank you. In the next look. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, nine questions. Uh, 
let me start with uh, foreign money stashed away. What if it comes into India? Uh, I mean, I, th I, I think, you know, money has, uh, money by itself is not an issue. Whether it's uh, Indian money that is round tripped or foreign money, clearly uh, the same effects, you know, if it comes in good times when you have plenty, it causes uh, problems. If it comes uh, in bad times when we have little, it's welcome more in that sense. Of course, there's a different legal issue of whether it was taken out under the right circumstances. As I said, we should make a separation. And that uh, the investigative agencies, uh, with our help, could pursue. Uh, but but uh, by itself, money is neither good nor bad. I don't think we can we can we can call it uh, one or the other. Um, on the uh, uh, point about uh, making in India, there were a couple of questions about uh, making in India, uh, making in India for Indians and so on. Uh, all I'm saying there is. We absolutely want to be the most competitive country in the world in manufacturing, in services, in agricultural production, in agricultural industry. And regardless of who the final consumer is, it makes sense for us to create the environment where production can flourish. That I see as making it. Now, if the world cooperates, the world is open, the world is eager to buy our stuff, so be it. And I'm not saying that if the world is not, we shouldn't attempt to sell abroad. We should. But unlike other countries which are relatively small, we also have a large domestic market. So we can also sell domestically when the world is slow. But in doing that, we have to be very careful that we don't create unsustainable demand. And this is why I said macro stabilization is very important. With macro stabilization, if we can increase domestic demand, then we have the we are making the best use of our large country, of the large economy. And if the global economy recovers, the production that we have targeted domestically can also go outside. Now, uh, I think there's a question on what do we do with uh, competition from other countries that come domestically. Well, a Clearly, if we can't even com compete domestically, we can give up competing internationally because domestically we have some advantages, low transportation costs, etc. So, uh, very clearly, we have to improve our productivity, improve our infrastructure, reduce business regulation, all those good things which enable us to compete domestically, which currently are in uh, 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 the government and uh, uh, others are working on. Uh, but uh, um, uh, I think the, uh, the fear of certain countries, uh, I think China was mentioned, uh, may also be somewhat overblown. Uh, I think uh, in a number of situations we have seen that when Indian industries put their mind to it, uh, they can compete with the best. And, and the competition may not be on the lowest price, it may be on quality. And quality, uh, if they put their mind to it, sometimes is, uh, can be a significant factor in drawing Indian customers away from cheaper foreign imports. So I would say it's not an open and shut case that our industries cannot compete. Um, uh, exchange rate over the next five years, uh, I think the, the broadly, if you look over the last 10, 15 years, our real effective exchange rate has been fairly stable. Uh, that means it's kept pace with inflation, which is one of the reasons we want to bring inflation down so that you don't have to keep seeing the nominal exchange rate uh, uh, volatile, that it also can stabilize if inflation comes down to more global levels. There's uh, some talk about the secrecy clause in, uh, in the banking system. Now, I want to make it clear that as a regulator, we have no intent or desire to protect malfeasance. <laughs> but at the same time, while Exposing, uh, you know, uh, malfeasance, is that the right word? Who have uh, been through a quasi-judicial process, the process of willful defaulter, we're very happy to make that list public. In fact, my people are working on, on making sure that we can put those lists uh, up uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an accessible way. Uh, also, uh, in uh, defaulters against whom suit has been filed, because that's already public information. 
At the same time, you have to be careful about putting any and every default up, regardless of the cause. Because, uh, and I used this example before, just imagine you forgot to pay your credit card bill. And that uh, sort of detail was flashed to all and sundry, put up on a website. And along with people who were serious defaulters, and there was no detail on what actually happened. Uh, what would you do? You'd tear up your credit card and throw it away because there's a big risk that one day you might forget and be put up for all to name and shame, right? Why take the risk at all? We have to be wary of killing entrepreneurship in this country by putting all the, uh, uh, you know, unsuccessful risk-taking in the same basket. We need risk-taking. We need people to take risks. It's only if having failed, they misuse the system or they misuse the system on the way to failure by uh, taking money out of the company and so on, uh, that we need, to, we need to go after them in a very big way. We have no intent of protecting those people, but we do want to protect privacy uh, in cases where there is no indication of malfeasance in order to protect entrepreneurship, in order to protect privacy. And that's why I think a blanket uh, edict that we should put everybody's name on the on the website again i would say think of it of yourself as a private person having that happen to you uh, you also take loans uh, in fact the credit card is a loan from the bank to you so you are a borrower from the system and if you default if your name went up immediately on the on the website of the bank and the banker came out said and named and shamed you would that be appropriate i think that's something to think about um, I think innovative disruptions are certainly good. Uh, that may be a silver lining in the fallout of regulating uh, regular banks, uh, but we have to be careful we understand those innovations fully. Uh, in recent uh, weeks, we've heard about a Chinese Ponzi scheme from peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, which essentially ran into the billions of dollars. So uh, one of the good things about digital technology is it can spread very widely, very quickly. One of the difficult things about digital technology for regulators is small uh, piece of activity can become very large very quickly. And if you don't understand the full ramifications, you don't have it under control, it could explode. Now, people say, what's the problem? This is not public money. These are private lenders lending to uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer platform to others who want to borrow. Well, sometimes that's not what the private lenders think. They think the peer-to-peer -peer platform is being regulated, that the peer-to-peer -peer platform has responsibility to recover their money in case things go bust, and then they, they show the fine print which says we're not responsible for anything, right? That would be a bad situation. In the same way as you have too, many, uh, too big to fail, you also have too many to fail. If we have 100,000 people who are having lost their money to a platform, you can uh, be fairly sure that there will be clamors for political action and there may be a political response which again involves public money. So uh, as the regulator of uh, you know, last resort in the country, when something happens, they always come to us and say, what were you doing? We have a responsibility to make sure that we understand the disruptive innovation. I've argued that we'll, we'll, we can look at it and watch it for a little while when it's small but by the time it becomes big, big, we should have understood it and understood what, what we should regulate. Uh, food inflation, uh, Ajay uh, asked about food inflation being controlled and whether it was done in the right way. Uh, my sense is that uh, uh, what we need to do is uh, work on increasing agricultural productivity, something I think you, you agree with. And that means improving the insurance processes in agriculture, uh, improving the access to markets, improving the access to technology, all of which I think uh, is, some, is, is work that is, is being done. Uh, to my mind, this, these are the places where we need to put a lot more effort to make sure these things work well, so that the farmer uh, doesn't see markets closed one day open, the other day, etc., but sees, uh, can plan and can uh, produce planning and knows that 
there is a ready market, there is storage facilities if there's overproduction, that, that things stabilize because of the underlying infrastructure. Uh, that's what we need to do. But of course, this is beyond my area of competence. I don't know anything about food management. Um, then uh, fixed income securities. Uh, typically, uh, a lot of the fixed income that uh, people invest in are, for example, deposit insured deposits. And so you believe that the value will not uh, uh, vary that much. Of course, if you're uh, investing in the junior tranches of uh, subprime mortgages, it can be very risky. Uh, and uh, any, uh, finance people would tell you that the more leverage there is, uh, the more debt looks like equity. Uh, and you're absolutely right there. Uh, when are we going to become two-eyed kings? Uh, that's the question. Uh, I think it depends both on what the rest of the world does and what we do. Uh, if the rest of the world accelerates and we don't, uh, obviously we become, uh, it, it takes us longer. My sense is the way it will go is our recovery, which is uh, picking up, uh, will indeed accelerate and perhaps bef before the rest of the world accelerates. But uh, somebody once said, you know, uh, if, as an economist, you should, uh, either talk about the direction or the time, but never both at the same time. <laughs> so uh, I will leave it there. Uh, uh, that's uh, Uber and Ola, that's the last question in the nine. Uh, I want to be very, very clear here. Uh, we did move against one of the taxi providers because they were violating our regulations as they stood, at least, uh, we needed to bring them into compliance with the regulation. And this is something I want to emphasize. Our intent is whatever regulations are on the books, good, bad, ugly, they have to be complied with at that moment. We can't wink, wink, nod, nod. If the regulation is a bad regulation, we change the regulation. And that's what, for these small value transactions, we've been trying to enable these kinds of providers to have hassle-free small value transactions. We've already done it with touch and go credit cards. We're working with people, we're open to working. But what is on the books has to be enforced. We don't want to be a paper tiger, we should not be a paper tiger. And, and if, if we have too many regulations, even small ones that are violated as a routine without any, any consequence, then we, we essentially uh, engender a culture of impunity which means the bigger uh, regulations also get violated. So I would say streamline regulations, we're in the process of doing that. Uh, we have a bunch of master circulars coming out which streamline, get rid of old regulations, etc. But whatever is on the books, complain about it. We will change it if necessary. But if it is there, you have to obey it. Now I see still a few impatient hands. It's the, I have to limit it to five quick questions. So with you first. Thank you. I'm Shashi Bala. I work with Lili Green National Labor Institute. I have a simple question. Uh, what is going to be the impact or what are the predictions on jobless growth if we capture the unpaid work that the example that you gave one woman working in the other house? Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman waiting there for a long time. Yes. Uh, my name is Vinesh. My question, perhaps, may be premature in the context of the Indian economy, but I'll still uh, ask it. The uh, fact that certain high consumption economies are now going towards what is called de-development. Now, if we spread our own uh, economic uh, uh, spread on a 100 meter uh, um, track, then perhaps we are from 75 meters to 10 meters in terms of the amount of consumption that, uh, are, uh, that are there in different facets of our uh, own economy. Now, should we also be looking at the concept of e-development? Because we are seeing the other countries as having gone in, in the regatta uh, context, gone to the edge and are coming back to perhaps 50 meters. Thank you. So that, yeah. There's one Thank up you. hand here. Yes, please. My name is Rahul Agarwal, I'm from Invest India. Uh, two questions, quickly. 
So you said that you know if, if you want to de deflate your currency, somebody else is gonna is gonna do that. However, as in in theory, there's J curve effect, which says in long term you have you will have more economic welfare, and in practice, China did it to an extent. We've not reacted to it. I, I don't think we've reacted to it. So did we miss the reaction part? Second, uh, we are, we're saying Brexit is a threat, right? Do you think it can be an opportunity, especially to make in India, and how? What can we do for that? Thank you. There's a question here. Good evening, sir. This is Rajiv Lala from ISS Energy. Um, I am interested in uh, something that the central bankers are also facing, and my industry is also facing, which is lower for longer. So, in the oil and gas sector, we are now facing a situation where oil prices are low. Do you see any complacency that is getting created across uh, that this will remain for a long period of time, and if this bounces back, uh, either for for uh, any set of reasons? Do you see risks uh, here for uh, the financial system? Thank you. Awesome. I'm Shanti from IDF. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajan, you mentioned macro prudential norms and also mentioned two big failed institutions. So the question is coming from there. Uh, so around the time the crisis took place or a couple of years later, there was this talk about regulating too big to fail institutions as standalone entities because they have the potential to sort of cause havoc across markets, across geographies. So, uh, so what is being done in India? When I think about uh, too big to fail, I think of LIC. I don't know. There may be others which, uh, from RBI perspective, are declared to be too big to fail. But are we sort of looking at them and uh, looking at their operations more closely, so to say? Thank you. Thank you. I think I'm afraid I'm going to have to close it at this point. Or is there a, oh yes, please, go ahead. Thank you, my name is Pierre Jacquet from the Global Development Network. Uh, two brief questions. One uh, question by uh, a foreigner looking at, uh, at India. And um, all over the world, the value creating activities are not job creating. Uh, and I, w I wonder whether you could uh, give an indication of where you see the potential for job creation in India, in a country in which manufacturing has not been faring very well over the last, uh, be beyond pockets of excellence, but global, global manufacturing has not been faring very well. My second question is about regulation. Uh, you commented about the shadow banking. Gary Gorton advocates that uh, it might be a good idea to give a charter uh, to the shadow banking in exchange for access to uh, central, bank, uh, central bank services. Um, what is your policy about, about regulation of the shadow banking activity? I think with that, you can have your last word. Okay. Um, uh, le let me take a question that I left out last time, which was on the JAM DBT loan. Uh, uh, this is about direct benefits transfers to uh, accounts via mobiles, etc. I think this is a very good uh, way to expand financial inclusion in the sense that rather than credit leading financial inclusion, payment should lead financial inclusion. As people get the ability and the sense of using money uh, and, uh, and uh, the next step would be savings, and once they can save and manage money, only then should the credit uh, pipeline be open. And this is where, for example, self-help groups, uh, the intent was first to get them to save, to understand uh, how to run small businesses and only then allow them uh, access to credit which uh, has the potential of getting them into trouble if they don't know how to manage money. So I, I think with the combination of technology as well as expansion in terms of financial inclusion, uh, new payment banks, new small finance banks, uh, the strengthening of the business correspondent, uh, there is a sea change which is going to happen in financial inclusion. And interestingly, a number of private banks, as well as some public sector banks, are finding that it's possible to make money lending to small businesses, lending to even tiny businesses. And some of our small finance banks, when they come in, I think will do a great job there. Um, you know, uh, I think I'm going to reinterpret the jobless growth uh, question. It's you know, if in a family the uh, 
let's say the woman produces a stereotype, goes out to work, uh, does it take somebody else's job and does it expand jobless growth? And there's a little bit of a, uh, what uh, sometimes called the lump of labor fallacy here, that, that really, you know, as uh, activity expands, it creates more possibilities, uh, possibilities for more activity. So I don't think the answer is to keep the lady back at home. Uh, if she does want to go out and work and do something different, that, that's fine. At the same time, one shouldn't denigrate the very important work that she's doing at home also. And I think we should allow an environment where she can make an intelligent choice. Um, this uh, concept of de-development, I, I haven't uh, paid a lot of attention to it, uh, not because it's not interesting, but I'm guessing what it means is that uh, you know, you, you don't grow as fast, you shut down certain kinds of activities. Uh, I do think that uh, there is room to think about what intelligent development should be. Uh, do we all need to consume as much, I think uh, Yashwant Sina once asked this, do we need, if we all consumed as much as the average suburban American household, uh, the world would become unsustainable. Yes, that would certainly be the case if we did that today. Perhaps over time we will learn how to have sustainable consumption, but there is a very real question of how much consumption is enough. And uh, I think of intelligent development as both producing in a more intelligent way so that we don't spoil the environment, we don't create bands, mm -hmm. uh, as well as consuming in a more intelligent in a way. And this is something that I thought was missing in Al Gore's uh, Inconvenient Truth. Uh, talked a lot about uh, the way we were spoiling without ever talking about trying to consume in a more effective and intelligent way, and we need to do both. Um, uh, reaction, I've written reaction to China, uh, and I'm not sure what, what I meant, what the question was, so. Uh, what? Oh, oh yeah, uh, that we didn't react to China when it depreciated your, uh, its exchange rate. You know, my, my uh, conviction is that Depreciating your exchange rate as a strategy for growth, and I'm, I see Suchi standing next to you, uh, sitting next to you, but uh, uh, depreciating your exchange rate as a strategy to growth is, uh, uh, is in the long term has its own problems. And I think we've seen that with Japan, we've seen that with, uh, uh, with China. It may create an environment where industries don't change because they benefit from the uh, protection of the exchange rate and as, as such when you remove that protection may suddenly become uncompetitive and that certainly is something to worry about. Um, uh, on the issue of Brexit, uh, I, I don't want to say something which uh, enters into that debate especially because I'm going to the UK next week. Uh, uh, all I will say is in general terms any uh, misfortune uh, to another country is rarely in this interconnected world an opportunity, an unmitigated opportunity uh, for us. Uh, we're always, the global economy is diminished when another country goes down. Yes, there may be some industries where you, you can get, get an advantage, uh, but in general, other people's misfortunes aren't uh, uh, on net uh, a benefit. Uh, we are too interconnected for that to happen. And I think on net, it typically is adverse. Uh, oil prices being low for long is certainly a source uh, of potential complacency. But I think that there are two, uh, certainly in the Indian case, two uh, mitigating buffers. One is, of course, that the government has increased excise taxes, even as the oil price has fallen. So there is a, it hasn't passed through everything. And so as a result, we are not as vulnerable if, if things, if prices go up again, uh, of course I'm not making any statement about what the government does if the prices go up. Uh, but the second is we've also got stronger foreign exchange buffers uh, and, uh, and to that extent uh, we're better prepared if in fact they, they go up. I think ultimately uh, energy security means we have to have uh, uh, access to oil within uh, uh, the land, uh, uh, access to energy. And so I think both the moves on renewable energy as well as the moves on increasing exploration are extremely important and valuable. 
Uh, too big to fail? Yes, we have systemically important institutions in the country, and we have an interregulatory process uh, to monitor large conglomerates and to make sure we understand what their the risks are. And uh, the uh, FSDC, uh, which brings together all the regulators uh, together with the finance minister, is a place where we do monitor potential risks from large entities. So uh, we are certainly looking at that. The resolution agency, when it actually is fully fleshed out, will help also in making us more confident we can resolve uh, complex institutions. At some point, uh, we will have to start talking about living wills and so on for these institutions. Um, yes, the world is moving with technology uh, uh, leaps and bounds where not all value creating activities are job creating. Mm -hmm. A lot more use of capital, a lot more use of intellectual property. Uh, uh, that's true. Uh, as a, a, you know, if you, if you are a, an economic optimist and you believe in the power of ingenuity, uh, you know that this cannot be a bad thing. Uh, if we can do things more cheaply, if we can do things in a way that doesn't involve drudge work, the world is better off. We only have to figure out how to spread the goodies and make sure they don't get consumed by one sector or another. So I think almost surely technological development at the worst can mean a problem of distribution, but certainly cannot make us worse off. And that means that the things we'll have to think about may differ over time, <coughs> but, uh, but I'm not pessimistic about how we deal with it. Uh, finally, uh, I've written here regulation of shadow banks. What was the question? Ah. In, in your talk, you mentioned that the shadow banking institution didn't have access to the central bank window. Yes. In a paper a few years ago, Gary Gorton uh, worked on the role of the shadow banking uh, in the crisis, and he ends the paper by arguing that maybe what should recognize the shadow banking as a specific actor with a sort of charter for the and giving access in exchange for regulation. I right. was wondering what your policy with yeah. respect to regulating yeah, shadow banking still was. I, I hear you. Uh, well, um, uh, what we have, uh, in terms of shadow banking, uh, we have a few players, the mutual funds, the non-bank <laughs> companies, uh, the um, MFIs, the microfinance institutions. And uh, typically what we do is we don't lend to them directly. But in times of distress, for example, in 2008, uh, we essentially open a window where we refinance banks that lend to them. And the point being that uh, perhaps credit decisions can be better taken by the banks, uh, but we can provide liquidity. And so by lending through the banks, the appropriate liquidity is provided, but they don't have direct access to the window. Now, there are some shadow bank players who have direct access to the window, primary dealers, for example, but they're typically banks. Now, uh, you know, uh, there are there is discussion about some market infrastructure, which again, you could, could call shadow banks, having access to the window in times of need. Uh, I think it's it's reasonably well established that, uh, that we will follow some kind of a badge rule. Uh, we will lend freely at, a, uh, at an adequate price. Uh, if in fact there are, there are liquidity difficulties. Now friends, you will agree this has been a treat. I now request Dr. Kathuria to propose a vote of thanks. Certainly, uh, you said that indeed was a treat. It's not every day that a central bank governor visits us to give such a scholarly and stimulating account of the current state of play in the Indian and the global economy. So thank you very much, Dr. Rajan, for this honor and privilege, and for making it to this truly special event that coincides with the 100th year of the birth of our founder chairman. You will all agree that the sixth K.B. Lal Memorial Lecture has been a triumph. Raghu has often been referred to as James Bond in the media. And those of you who watched the film Inside Job 
would recall the approximately three minutes that he spent in which he said in the film, in which he was accused of being a Luddite for essentially saying uh, that you can't make more money without taking on more risk. In his seminal paper of 2005, Raghu asked whether financial development has made the world riskier, and his answer, as you know, was a decisive yes. The Princeton economist Alan Blinder in a 2009 interview said that when Raghu disagreed with Greenspan in 2008, he was up there on the foothills of Mount Olympus disagreeing with Zeus. I actually scanned the net for interesting insights into Raghu's life, uh, you know, away from economics and away from his professional activities. And I found a very touching story. I hope it's accurate, <laughs> but I'm going to nonetheless relate it to you. And I beg your indulgence for just a few moments. In a class in IIT Delhi where Raghu went, as you know, a physics professor recounted the following incident in his first class. Oh, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Do you want to hear it? No. I don't remember it. Maybe it happened, but I don't Well, well, I, 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 I'm torn between my research and Raghu, Raghu's professionalism. So I will uh, uh, pass, but. What I will say is that that story recounts the fact that Raghu influenced some lives, perhaps many lives, mm -hmm. and the widely held opinion about him as a scholar par excellence, as we just noted, is equally matched by his attributes as a gentleman. I once again express our gratitude to him for delivering the 6th KB Lal Memorial Lecture and wish him continued success in his current assignment. I also express profound gratitude to Rajiv Lal for inviting Raghu. As Ishan has already mentioned, the previous speakers in this series have been Professor Michael Spence, David Vines, Dr. Mervyn King, Professor Larry Summers, and Dr. Andrew Sheng. The next KB Lal Memorial will be held after we have occupied our new premises in Sakhir, which Isha spoke of. There is one Nobel Prize winner, winner in the list of six KB Lal Memorial speakers, uh, including today, so far. I'm quite sure many more Nobels will be added to that existing list soon. Dr. K. B. Lal was ICRIA's founder chairman, and Isha has described that, and Dr. Lal's illustrious career spanned more than six decades, and he was educated in universities in Delhi, London, and Oxford, and Dr. K. B. Lal was appointed to the Indian Civil Service in 1938. In an article that was written soon after his passing, Mr. Mani Shankarai, sitting here, uh, described him as the last ICS greats and his guru in the civil service, besides being a mentor to former external affairs minister Yashwan Sinha, uh, planning commission member Mr. M.K. Singh, GATT and WTO specialist who was professor in the Anwarul Hoda, and former cabinet secretary Surendra Singh, among a myriad others. others. Mr. Ayer recalls a charming incident, which I wish to relate, uh, when he, Mr. Ayer, was driving down to Luxembourg to deliver President Radhakrishnan's message to the Luxembourg press. But the president's message had still not arrived. He went to the then, then ambassador, K.B. Lal's room, with his problem. Mr. K.B. Lal listened gravely and then said, there was a message. Can I have it, sir, said Mr. Rayo. No, said K.B. Lal, because you are still to write it. <laughs> Astonished, Mr. Ayer said, was at a loss for words and started stuttering, to which Mr. K. B. Lal replied, and this was in Hindi, and I'll translate it. Akhir, tumhare jaisa babu hi to waha bhi likh raha hoga. To tum hi luk dalo. After all, some bureaucrat like you in Delhi would be writing it there. Instead, why don't you write it? Dr. Lal was convinced uh, that India had to make the transition from being an excessively inward-oriented economy, as Isher has also pointed out, and this required preparation and changes in domestic policy. And ICRI, as you know, has been established to enhance the kind of evidence basis for informed policy making. And Dr. Lal set up ICRI 
for this very purpose, and we are extremely proud in Utria to carry this legacy forward. In the flyer that has been distributed to you today, you will read that Utria is today ranked as one of the top think tanks in the world. Of the 80 members of Dr. K. Bilal's, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of the 80 members of Dr. K. Bilal's family, around 50, I'm told, that is about 60% are present here today. All his children, Dinu Shah, Ashok Lal, Ranjana Pandey, and Rajiv Lal are present. As you know, and as Raghu mentioned as well, Rajiv is in the process of writing history with his new IDFC bank. Five out of nine grandchildren, one from the US and another from Dubai are here, and two of his great grandchildren are also here. Wherever he is, Dr. Lal must be feeling very proud of his creations. A special thank you to the entire Kedi Lal family. To the audience, and I see many, many distinguished uh, people here. Thank you for being here. Any seminar is incomplete without your support. To our Ikriya family, Sanjana Joshi, a proud mother whose daughter yesterday secured 99% in her uh, board, tw 12th board exams. And to Manmeet, Rajkumar, Neha, Kishan, and the entire team of Ikriya, apologies if I've left out any, who helped uh, organizing this event with such precision, a big thank you. To the media that are assembled here, thank you. And I hope you will continue to support us in the future as well. And finally, may I take this opportunity to thank our distinguished board members who graciously, graciously continue to support our activities behind the scenes. Uday Kotak has generously supported this event. And Dr. Shankar Acharya, the honorary distinguished professor at Ikriris, is representing Kotak in Uday's absence. To our chairperson, Dr. Ishar Aluwalia, who is deeply vested in ICRIA's well-being, thanks for moderating skillfully and chairing the session and for welcoming Dr. Raghuram Rajan, whose brilliant talk will remain etched forever in ICRIA's memory. Once again, thank you to all of you, and may you have a pleasant evening.